Hi, welcome to the Flawed Theology Podcast. I'm Phil. And I'm Susie. And we're asking the question, if your theology were wrong, wouldn't you want to know? All right. Well, hey, everybody. We're excited today to have a really special guest. Like, we're probably freaking out a little bit. So if if we get like winded and out of breath, it's not because either of us is on the treadmill. It's because we have a really special guest today. It's kind of a funny story of how we managed to get this person on our little show today. Are you going to say who it is or is it a well, mystery? No, I'm going to keep it a mystery for a little bit. You can tell the story and then you can okay. give away who it is in the story. All right. So I connected with this friend on Facebook. We're very like-minded. We had a conversation one night and then I started like a three-way thing with me and her and Phil and she was like, hey, have you guys heard of Anthony Magnabosco? And I was like, of course we have. Like, I've watched all of his videos. And Phil was like, yeah, we've seen, you know, all his stuff. She goes, you should ask him to be on the podcast. And of course, I'm like, no way. He would never come on our podcast. We're a bunch of nobodies. And Phil, being the ambitious overachiever that he is, <laughs> decided, yeah, why not? I'm going to go email him. <laughs> he unbelievably said yes. And we're still kind of shocked about that, but we're so appreciative that you took the time out of your busy schedule to come talk to us. Oh, I'm excited to be here. I, I've actually been turning down a lot of interviews, especially religious-based ones or, or uh, post-religion-based ones, because we've been trying to move SC out of that realm. But there was something, I don't know, maybe it was because there were two people and you've been blogging and it seemed like you're really committed to it. I thought, well, let me just <laughs> uh, let me just meet with them and just, we'll, we'll, we'll have fun, you know, and Wow. So yeah, thank you for inviting me. And I'm glad that I accepted it, at least so far. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. You might change your tune at the end and be like, why did I talk to those two idiots? Maybe. Like <laughs> They don't even know what they're doing. Well, yeah, we really appreciate you being here. And for those of you who don't know who Anthony is, you've probably been living under a rock. You know, if you're following our f- podcast, you're probably well-versed. I'll read a little bit of his bio. Um, so you guys are familiar with his work and who he is, but he is a skeptic and an atheist from San Antonio, Texas, which... I got a lot of questions about that, but uh, he's been practicing and promoting a concept called street epistemology since 2013. And we'll get into what that is. Um, And Anthony has had several hundred chats, many of them on video uh, and uploaded to his YouTube channel and where he, he just engages people on a lot of conversations about God, ghosts, karma, law of attraction, a lot of social and political topics. You've been on a ton of podcasts. So we feel privileged to be in that list. And then now your new venture is that you are the founder and current executive director of a new nonprofit called the Street Epistemology International. So we're excited to hear about that. Anything else you want to kind of add about who you are? And That's about it. I'm, I'm about as average as a person could be. Honestly, I just kind of stumbled across Street Epistemology and started having conversations and nobody was really doing it at the time. It, it, I guess I have sort of a knack for it and... I have two kids. They're just about on the threshold of moving out of the house. Uh, one is one is uh, a junior in college, and the other one starts his freshman year in three weeks. Oh, cool! So we're right on this threshold of shifting gears a little bit in life. You have a little more freedom now. <laughs> a little more, yeah, yeah, I think so. Cool, cool. So yeah, we're definitely going to talk um, at length about street epistemology. But before we get to that, tell us a little bit about like your faith background growing up. Mm. You know, how did that kind of shape you into kind of who you are now? I don't know if it really shaped me. I mean, I, the thing is I, I was raised in a very religious family in a really religious community, mostly Catholic, like Catholic Italian, although it was a very diverse neighborhood. Mm. You know, we'd be dry every Sunday, we'd go to the Catholic church and we'd pass three or four different churches on the way. And I, I, I was actually thinking about it this morning that I'm, I'm, I'm sure I've asked my parents, well, what is that church about? And it, that was the Lutheran church and we didn't go there. So I was always asking questions and I always really, as far back as I can remember, never really bought into it. Like even as a young kid, I was questioning it and my parents were very alarmed at my questions. And I just went through the motions the whole time until I moved out of the house and then uh, found my spouse and we got married and then starting having kids ourselves. And that's, you, that's kind of around the time where I was, I was pretty much ambivalent about religion until, I mean, 9-11 was a big deal. And then also seeing my kids growing up and then being asked questions here in Texas about, well, what church do you go to and that type of stuff. (laughs) Yeah. That really kind of shifted gears towards activism and wanting to do something. And then I stumbled across street epistemology, which totally changed the way that I interact with believers for the better, I think. Yeah. Your, Your childhood sounds a lot like mine. I was raised in a very religious family. And as far as I can remember, basically like around 10 years old and above, I never really bought into it. And I had so many questions in my family 
did not like me asking questions. For me, that was very isolating. Was that isolating for you? How did you deal with that? It was isolating and it messed with my mind. I didn't realize it at the time, but I, and I don't know for sure, but I was a very anxious, nervous kid and I even had tics and things. And I remember just being really nervous and anxious a lot. And I wondered looking back if some of that was because every, everyone around me was acting as if this stuff was real and I didn't believe it. And I just yeah. felt like an outsider the whole time. Or maybe like you're the crazy person. Yeah. It messed with my mind, I think. And and I had some resentment. So as I transitioned from ambivalent to I'm an atheist activist, my first approach was to lash out at my loved ones. Like if you go back to, to Facebook, I'm sure the posts are still out there. <laughs> I have a brother-in-law and and family members and friends even that I just... I was striking back at them because I was so pained. I, I think I sort of was coming to grips with the pain that those beliefs caused me. So I lashed out at them. Mm -hmm. it, it was ugly. Yeah. And I've, I damaged a lot of relationships too, that they're, they're still unrecoverable today, I think, because of that. Oh, that's unfortunate. Did you, did you go through an angry atheist phase or anything? <laughs> Sometimes people do. I went through like a resentful phase. I try not to get angry. Yeah. I don't know about you, Phil. Were you ever angry? Well, I was perpetually angry, but kind of like for a different. So I grew up like independent, fundamental Baptist from in utero. So I was a Christian from the time I was four years old when I got saved, which I put in quotes. And then I, I think I was actually angry, but didn't realize it really until later in life. And I always kind of took it as like, I'm just mad about everything because people are stupid, you know, but <laughs> I think I had internalized a lot of the fundamentalist beliefs and then kind of how I view the world kind of made me angry about everything. So, but as an atheist, no, I've actually feel like my anger, <laughs> I never had an angry atheism phase. I actually feel much lighter and freer having let go of all those beliefs. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I wouldn't say that I'm angry today. And actually Susie said um, resentful. That's pro I think I was more resentful than angry, but my resentment came across as anger. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, because there's a fine line. And betrayal. Yeah, I remember fe feeling very betrayed. Yes, for sure. Like these people, I had trusted them to guide me through life and they had taught me something that is completely unjustifiable. And I felt very betrayed about that. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, like, like a lot of times you probably don't view that your religious upbringing really shaped you, but it's almost that it made you into who you are now and how you view the world. And especially when you got to having your own kids and things like that, you were like, probably were adamant. I will make sure to not have this happen to my kids. And I think Susie and I both are in that both. We're like, we will not oh, yeah. indoctrinate our kids. Like, Oh yeah. There were yeah. a lot of things growing up, even, even dating when I remember I was dating this, this woman and we were babysitting for this very religious family and they had six or seven kids and, you know, Noah and Caleb, and they had all these <laughs> Bible names. And then afterwards yeah. I was just like, that is not how I want to raise my family. And, and she was like, wasn't that wonderful? That's exactly how I want to raise my Oops. family. Oops. <laughs> so, you know, from that point, yeah, <laughs> yeah. this is not going to work out. Yeah. Mm -mm. So in your bio, like you, you call yourself a skeptic and an atheist in the Christian world. Those are two very charged words. So wh mm. what do those words mean to you? Like when you say skeptic, what does that mean to you? A skeptic is not a cynic. A skeptic is somebody who I think objectively weighs the pros and cons of the reasons people have for thinking something is true and then taking a tentative position on things, not being dogmatically certain about anything yeah, and being open to changing your mind. That's yeah. kind of an, in a nutshell, what I would call a skeptic. Yeah. And it has like a negative confirmation. Oh, you're so skeptical about everything, especially in evangelical Christianity, everything is black and white and, and it's viewed as a negative thing, but really in the mm. rest of the world, outside of religion, skepticism is, is viewed as something that's actually healthy, right? I, I think so. I think it should. Yeah. I think having a skeptical mindset prevents you from being tricked and taken advantage of. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And it boggles, yeah. boggles my mind when you run into somebody who, who demonizes skepticism or critical thinking. Like when I first started yeah. doing SE, I remember being stunned, the street preachers, I mentioned something about critical thinking and they started laughing. <laughs> oh, like that's the, really sad. That, yeah. Yeah. Totally sad. yeah. And then the, the atheist, do you want me to de define the atheist thing too? Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about that one too. Cause that's also a word you, you just, when you're a Christian, you hear the word atheist and you get this like immediate picture in your head of this angry person who wears black all the time and worships Satan. And that's not what atheism is at all. Yeah. How would you define 
what atheism is. For the longest time, I didn't feel comfortable even saying that word in my in front of my family. Even my my immediate family, like with my wife and kids, even like even like I'm going back to like 2000, early 2000s. I would sort of like athe, you know, almost <laughs> hush the term, almost because <laughs> like because there was such a stigma with it. Now we just drop the word left and right whenever it comes up. Yeah, an atheist, in my view, is someone who who thinks that there are no gods or lacks the belief in any god. There, there's two common definitions. Right. It's it's not a person who says there are no gods. I'm not making the claim that there are no gods. There very well could be. Right. But I'm just not convinced by any of the arguments that people give for thinking that there's one. Right. And that's my label for atheist. Yeah. Right. And that always gives you the out where if you're presented with new information or new evidence, then you can say, okay, I'm willing to grant there could be this God or there could be that God, but mm -hmm. you're not saying dogmatically there is no God because then you're just as dogmatic as the other side. Right. Yeah. And actually, I remember being in front of the Alamo talking to the street preachers when I first started going out and doing SE. I remember a, a preacher pulled out a dictionary because I gave that definition. The definition that I just gave, it was more or less the same thing. Someone who think, who doesn't believe that there are any gods. And he showed me a definition that basically said, it's someone who knows there's no God. Mm. So there's a lot of confusion. So even <laughs> yeah. dictionaries, I think, don't have the, the definition that most atheists who publicly identify as an atheist, they don't usually use that definition. They're not usually mm -hmm. saying that they know there are no gods. Right. No, they would say, like, I, I don't have a reason to think there's any there's a God, just like I don't have a reason to think there are unicorns or yeah. a teapot out in space. Yeah. Right. Right. So there, there's a disconnect even between books that people look at for definitions and what the common vernacular is in, in atheist circles, I think. So street epistemology, SE, as in case people aren't familiar with the acronym, explain kind of what that is for people who don't know what it is. It's essentially a different way of conversing with people where you're not giving them facts to show that they're wrong about whatever claim they make. You're instead asking them to explain to you and to themselves how they became convinced that they're right. How did they get to their conclusion? What was the reasoning process that they used to arrive at their belief? And that's street epistemology in a nutshell. And there's steps and, you know, there's a, there's sort of a pattern that you can follow essentially, but it's a way of setting aside the claim that the person is making and examining how they concluded that that claim is true, yeah. getting to their reasons and the methods that they use to verify that they have good reasons for thinking that. Yeah, That's all it is. And it's mostly asking questions and taking yourself out of it and making it about them. Right. That's street epistemology in a nutshell. So it's judging, not judging, but it's evaluating their technique of how they arrived at that, not evaluating the claim. Is that exactly? Okay. Yes. Um, there's, there's a book that came out called how minds change. And there's a whole chapter on street epistemology. We're so excited about it. Oh, that's cool. So maybe oh, your neat. viewers can check it out. Yeah. yeah. But they make it, they make a distinction between topic rebuttal and technique rebuttal. Okay. Topic rebuttal is what we typically do. You make a claim and I'm going to rebut your topic. I'm going to talk about your claim and why your claim is wrong in technique rebuttal. And rebuttal is actually a problematic word because it seems like we're rebutting it. Right. But in, in a technique rebuttal approach like street epistemology, we're exploring the technique or the method that they used to arrive at their conclusion. Right. Yeah. By focusing on the technique, it, it takes people away from the belief that's tied to their identity. But it seems by focusing on the technique that they use to get to their conclusion rather than the conclusion itself, it opens people up and it doesn't raise defenses and it helps you helps them basically take another look at how they reason to their conclusion. And that is what seems to be the beginning of belief revision, mm. which is really exciting because we we see today so many people walking around with beliefs that, that are really problematic. Um, they're likely wrong. And our society can actually be teetering on the edge, I think, at some point, you know, with, mm -hmm. with these beliefs that people hold. So we're really excited about it, not, not just for religious claims, for all sorts of claims that people make. Yeah. It's always really interesting in your videos and depending on who you approach, like some people are like kind of happy go lucky when you first approach them. And then some people you can tell that they want to be standoffish. And then it's usually within 30 seconds or so of your conversation, you can like almost visually see the tension disappear from the conversation. And when you get mm -hmm. them to think about something, you can see their face go, 
oh man, I never, like, it's almost like I never thought of it that way. A lot of people have never evaluated why they believe what they believe or how they know things, which is what epistemology is like, you know, studying how we know things. Mm -hmm. I'm an argumentative person, so I love to argue. And I like to think I'm I'm a data person. So it's like, okay, I've got reasons to support this claim and here's why you should believe my data, but Mm -hmm. no one changes their mind that way. And so that's, what's really interesting about SE is like, you're not changing their mind. They're changing their mind by just asking themselves these questions. And it's, it's fascinating to watch. Like it is. Yeah. It's fascinating to, to be a part of it. And, and yeah, so that's, so I did it a few times. Like I got to record this, you know, and I started going out with my camera and capturing, uploading it. And that's, what's neat. It's, it's to see people reflecting on their beliefs in a really important, you know, really reflect like a really honest, sincere way. And you might actually meet somebody who, who will respond to your data. Like data (laughs) still has a place, But if you don't, if you don't build trust and show that you're listening and that you don't want to misrepresent them, and then you reveal that their real reason is based on data, then it might be the time to give them their data. But if you lead with that, Mm -hmm. you're taking a huge risk. Like you could just jeopardize the whole conversation because you're giving them facts that they won't find convincing anyways. Right. Mm -hmm. You have to first figure out what what it is that's propping up their belief. Yeah. Yeah. And what I like about this method is that it's taking you out of it. And it's putting all the focus on on your conversation partner. So that way it can't ever devolve into a battle. I feel like so many times when we have debates and arguments with people, it turns into a battle and we start yelling. And that takes, you know, the risk of that happening out of the equation. For sure. If you do it right. Yeah. When I first started going out, I went to the Alamo to talk to the street preachers. And then I noticed, well, there's people who have all, the, all different sorts of claims. And I even started running into Muslims. And then I bought a, a bought a Quran because I, I thought, oh, I have to know this book really well. And you don't. That's the, the, be- mm-hmm. the beauty of the approach is that you don't need to know anything about the claim that they're making because they are presumably the experts at it. They have this belief. They think it's true to some degree of confidence. And you're right. It's all about taking yourself out of it and asking them how they came to their conclusion. So in the act of them educating you about their belief and their reasoning, that's what's causing them to reflect on their own reasoning. So yeah. It, yeah, you don't need to know. It, it takes the pressure off of you for sure. Yeah. And I've even seen some people in your videos try to throw Bible verses at you and you you always step back and say, oh, I, I'm not really here to discuss the Bible or I, I don't know what's <laughs> in there. And then you steer it back to like, how do you know that's true? Yeah. And so that I think that works really well. It's almost better to not have a preconceived notion about their belief because that it enables you to actually listen like you're trying to understand because you actually are, you know, like you're not automatically thinking with, oh, I'm getting ready to rebut this point. You're actually, mm. you're actually listening. Like, yeah. Yeah. It's really tempting, especially if you know the Bible or, or a holy book really well, and you know, the counter verses, <laughs> it's, it's hard to not do that. Yeah. That, that's, yeah. that's what people struggle with the most. It's so easy to kind of fall back into, well, let me show you that you're wrong type of approach. And if you could just like, don't do that and just figure like, I want to understand how you determine that you're right. And that shifts the whole dynamic. And they're now doing the driving and you're a passenger. Right. What kind of prompted you to go out and do this? Cause like, I like to have conversations with people and I mm-hmm. even grew up in the Christian belief of like, you know, you go out and witness and evangelize and I've gone door to door, you know, doing that kind of thing. It was never something that I enjoyed doing. I something I did because I had to. So like, how did you mm-hmm. get involved in, the first time you went out to go talk to a street preacher, what was your thought process when you got to do that? Well, my thought process was a little off when I first did it because I was taking notes. I was looking at Bible verses and, and I, I didn't really know still what SE was. It was introduced in this book called A Manual for Creating Atheists, and it was geared towards atheists to talk to believers. And the book even said, like, you know, this is to inspire people to go out on the street and go into the churches and talk to people. So I sort of had that mentality but the approach was still being developed, I guess. Like we didn't really know what we were doing. Even when, even when I started going out and doing it, I just had, had a rough guide. Um, so I guess it, to answer your question, it was the book that prompted me to go out and do something. Plus, I, you know, on YouTube, you saw videos of atheists arguing with street preachers. Yeah. <laughs> and I love, I love those videos. I couldn't get enough of them. <laughs> and I thought, well, I can do that. So, so. If you look at my earlier work, I'm literally yelling at street preachers, which if you look at my, if you look at my later stuff, there's, there's no yelling going on. Right. There was a lot that we just didn't know because we didn't know it. 
Right. But another another motivation was seeing the harm that these religious beliefs were causing in my society, in my immediate family. Um, you could see it online. Of course, 9-11 was a big thing too. It's like, someone needs to do something about this. Like uh, nobody's pushing back on these views in a really productive way. So that was a, that was like a kernel of my motivation was to try to have better talks with people. That's interesting. So I mean, when you, you've referenced 9-11 a couple of times. So when you mm-hmm. say 9-11, are you talking about kind of the immediate cultural assumption that all Muslims are terrorists? And that if you see someone in a hijab, there's a chance that she has a suicide bomb <laughs> underneath, you know, mm-hmm. this view, you're talking about the kind of view towards Islam, that it was all no. terrorism or no. What was it about 9-11 that kind of was your triggering factor? I, th- I it, it wasn't about Islam at all. Oh, okay. Like uh, it was more like, look at what these religious beliefs can do to people. Oh, okay. Look, th- you know, these beliefs can motivate people to do horrendous things. What is going on here? How are they becoming so convinced? Why don't I think that this is true to that to that degree of certainty? Like I, I was, I was fascinated in it from a psychological point of view, more so than anything. Oh, that's interesting. And that's what you know. When I stumbled across this other podcast called "You Are Not So Smart," the same guy that wrote the book. Uh, how minds change that I mentioned earlier. Mm. Like that, that's a big, a big area of interest for me is why do people believe these things on what seems like really poor evidence? What's driving it? And how do we help them? That was a big motivation. It wasn't a, a, focused on a specific religion or anything like that. Yeah. There's been a lot of people that have studied religions and like why people believe things. What makes SE kind of unique versus some mm-hmm. of the other techniques that are used? I think we kind of covered it a little bit, but Like, are there Um, other things that you think stand out? There are. I think SE is sort of a mix between philosophy and psychology. And you don't see conversational techniques that utilize both of those. The philosophy side of it is identifying what the claim is and maybe getting a really clear definition, sort of like what you might see in the Socratic method. Let's really define this word extremely clear so I understand what you're talking about. But then there's also the psychological component of, well, what is supporting this? And what would your life be like if you didn't have this belief? And what is this belief giving you? It's sort of a merge of those two things. And you don't usually see that in a debate, for one thing. Um, Right. You don't usually see it in any kind of approach. Uh, The other thing I think is really unique about SE, I'm going to compare street epistemology to another technique that's mentioned in that book, How Minds Change. It's called deep canvassing. Have you heard of that yet? yet have not it's this it's this movement that sort of started on the west coast where people would go and knock on doors and give a very personal narrative about why you should vote in favor of trans rights for bathrooms or something like that street epistemology doesn't leverage emotions we try to take ourselves out of it it's not about us it's about our whoever we're, we're speaking with okay um that's another that's another thing that i think makes it unique is is that we want to make it all about our conversation partner and how they arrived at their conclusion. And I'm not, a, I'm not aware of other, other approaches that do anything remotely like that. And if you approach a person's view like that, what ends up happening usually is they begin to realize that they maybe shouldn't be as so sure that they're right about it as they were before the conversation. And that could be the beginning of, of lowering their confidence or finding better reasons for thinking that it's true or getting rid of the belief altogether. Mm-hmm. SE is, in my view, like it's one of the most profound things that I think could help humanity going forward. I think there's a huge potential for it. It's not just about flagging people on the street and interviewing them. Like we can be embedding this type of interaction in any conversation we have with our friends and family. Yeah. So that that leads into another question I had about, and I have not had very many conversations with my family about religion, but when I do, I really want to incorporate some of these principles so that it doesn't become a fight. What are some tips that you would give for adapting SE to, you know, have a conversation with your dad or your sister or your mom? This is one of our biggest challenges because SE seems really easy to do with a stranger on the street who's not right. anticipating a, a discussion about their God belief or any anything else. But when you when you try to use SE with somebody who you know, there's additional challenges. And a couple of pieces of, of advice is you could warn or give your give your dad a heads up, for example, if it's your dad, you say like, I'd like to explore that claim with you. You put this in your own words, but I'd like to explore that claim with you, but I'd like to do it in a, in a way different than maybe I've done it in the past. Like maybe even acknowledge, I know we've argued about this topic before, 
and I'd like to try something different. You could try that because if you just jump into SE types of questions, it's going to seem artificial. It won't seem sincere and you do want to be sincere. So my advice would be lay all your cards out on the table. You can say like, listen, dad, you know, I know we butted heads in the past and I don't agree with what you're saying, but I'm fascinated with why you think that that's true. Yeah. And if you're willing, if you're willing, would you let me just ask five or 10 minutes of questions? And then at the end, you can ask me any questions in return, or, you know, we can make it a back and forth, maybe lay some ground rules down so that they, they don't get freaked out later when you're doing something that you don't normally do. I love that. Yeah. That's so good. Yeah. That's good. Because like you already have a framework and like years of history of conversations, Mm -hmm. you know, when you're having a conversation with someone, you know, and yeah, if you're trying to use it like a tactic, that people yeah. are going to pick, they're going to pick up on it. It's like, oh, are you reading off a script? Like, mm-hmm. <laughs> you mm-hmm. know, like, so, yeah. Well, I was going to say another piece of advice too, is sometimes there are, there are claims that they're, they're just, they're just taboo in your family. You know, you don't talk about them because of the past history or whatever. Another option is to, is go broader. So if you know that they really value, I don't know, the Bible or a particular website, maybe just have a broader discussion about, well, can we talk about what you think evidence is or, you know, what is it, what is it like to change your mind? You, you could be talking about broader or like, what do you, what do you think truth is or that type of stuff? You can kind of get into the philosophy side of it. And yeah. in the process of them talking about these broader concepts, they will end up bringing up those claims. Okay. So if they can bring up the claim, as opposed to you bringing up the claim that goes, that, that really helps. That really helps sliding into a conversation where you're asking some SE types of questions. I love that idea of like establishing what is truth when you have mm-hmm. your your thing and you're like, is it Tic Tacs or something? Yeah, and you're like, yeah, even or odd? Is this, you know, do you agree that the number of Tic Tacs mm-hmm. in this container is either even or it's odd? Mm-hmm. There it is. <laughs> mm-hmm. And the person has to say one, one way or the other, or, you know, this is my truth. And then that's a whole nother issue. Then, you know, maybe if they say, well, that would be my truth. That's not going to lead to productive conversations, even if you do SE with them. Absolutely. So like we make so many assumptions when we talk to somebody about the claim that they make, let's say they make a claim about God. We assume that they think truth is objective and it's the same for everybody. We assume that they, that they value truth and they care that this belief is true. There's a lot of things that we assume. We assume that they'll change their mind if presented with good evidence to the contrary. You can't make those assumptions, but we do. And we engage on the claim and then we mm-hmm. hit all these roadblocks, which cause frustration. Right. So it's really healthy just to take a step back and go broad and try to work your way in with them. I think that's such fantastic advice. Yeah, that's awesome. Now I'm going to go talk to my dad. <laughs> and I wish I, knew, I wish I knew this three years ago even, but this, yeah. this is stuff that's been revealed as we've been putting together a, a self-directed course to teach people how to do this and develop training materials. So we're, we're learning at light speed here on this stuff. Well, and just the whole thing, like with the us versus them concept, we talk about this all the time on our podcast about how Christianity, it kind of divides people. It creates an us versus them mentality. And we want to avoid that also when we do our talking to people. We don't want to like cause divides and say, well, you know, I'm an atheist, you're a Christian, we're on opposite sides of this debate. The SE, I feel like it closes that gap and it puts us on the same side where we're just trying to get to the truth together. That's what it feels like to me. That, that's a good way. Like the, the thing though, is that a lot of people think that they have the truth and they're not in a curious exploring kind of mode because they're right. And <laughs> right. you're, you're the poor misguided person. So even though, yeah, I mean, that is the optimal starting point where you're both on a search for the truth and you're open-minded. Uh, unfortunately, like so many people are so dogmatic. This gets to the whole skepticism part that we started with. Like, like I think our society would be so much better if we were a little bit more responsible and humble about what we claim to know. Yeah. And a lot of people are so overconfident, but they don't realize it. And their overconfidence then ticks us off because it's like, you're just not, why can't you be open-minded? Yeah. And then that just leads to difficulty in in exploring their reasons. Yeah. And it gets perpetuated from generation to generation. Well, we have have lots of bad examples of people. I mean, it's all over social media. Our, Our parents are not probably not necessarily the best models of interactions on difficult topics. This is why I think SE is catching a lot of people's attention and has been over the years is because it's so much different from what we typically see people interacting uh, on, on challenging topics. Yeah. And I think it gives people hope. And, and I think that that hope mm-hmm. is justified. 
the more yes. I learn about this approach. Are there like basic steps or basic questions that are part of like, for lack of a better term, a formula to have an SE conversation? Mm-hmm. It didn't start off this way. Like when I first started going out, there weren't any steps. We didn't know what we were doing. So people started having SE conversations and reporting them back either through video or just by typing out in, in, a, in a Facebook group or something. Like I had this conversation with my mom. She said this, now I'm stuck. And what ended up happening through thousands of conversations and sharing what we were learning in a collaborative way, like in a community, in various communities, we started noticing an optimal order of questions that tended to lead to the best results. Hmm. And that's good for teaching people how to do this, but it's, that's not bad, but it's problematic if you want to present this as a genuine like fact-finding, compassionate approach, because it almost cheapens it when you put it into steps. Mm-hmm. So we're, we're, we're trying to like walk this like razor's edge of, we want to keep it like honest and genuine, sincere, but we also want to teach a lot of people how to do it. And you don't want it to be a script. We don't have to be, it shouldn't be a script because you want to go where your conversation partner takes you, but there is a certain destination that you are trying to get to. And that's reflection. I want to help my dad when we talk about religion to reflect on how he could be so sure that he's right and how you get there. You can get there a variety of different ways, but there, there does seem to be a, a little bit of a, a pattern, I guess, or a script to it, but it, it runs the risk of jeopardizing the sincerity of what you're doing. Mm-hmm. So it's good for learning and it's good for practicing, but if you get more and more familiar with it, you start, you just forget about the steps and you start just having SE types of conversations. And that's the ultimate goal where it just becomes a part of your natural everyday t- type of interaction. You're not even doing anything. You're just being a, a naturally inquisitive, empathetic person. Mm-hmm. That's the goal. Yeah. That's the goal. Yeah. I think you have an idea of what you want to accomplish, mm-hmm. but you're not going to like fixate on one, two, three, four. I have to hit these four things. Exactly. You know? Yeah. I think there's I mean, a lot. That's what, that's what you do in evangelical witnessing. It's like, okay, I've got to start with <laughs> establishing that you're a sinner. Would you agree that you're a sinner? Oh with yeah. The end goal, with exactly. the end goal of them showing up at your church the next Sunday. Right. right. And, and putting money yeah. in the offering plate, of course, because that's, yeah. the, that's so the real goal. About goals. It is there. There's a couple of goals you can have. Like one of your goals can simply be, I want to talk with this person who I vehemently disagree with and think that they're wrong to better understand why they think that they're right. So clarity could be one of your goals. Another goal could be, I want to help them reflect on their reasoning, maybe give them something to think about. Another goal could be um, ending on good terms so that, that you meet with them again. Another goal could be, no, I want them to realize that they don't have good reasons for thinking this and I want them to change their mind. <laughs> You can have a variety of different goals and those goals can switch during the conversation. <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with sharing your goals with them. This is this is one thing that, I, that we're trying to push. Like SE isn't something that you sneakily do on people. You can reveal your goals very clearly and that works in your favor because now you've laid all your cards on the table. You're being transparent. You're being honest. You have hopefully informed consent from them. And then you're moving through your questions. And if at any point they're like, "Uh, I don't like where this is going, or I want to ask you questions in return, or why are you doing this again? Like you can just stop and, and ask, answer their questions. It doesn't have to be a sneaky thing. The, The goal honestly is, is to model this form of engagement. So they will learn it and start to use it on their own beliefs with themselves and with other claims that they encounter from other people. Mm hmm. All right. That yeah. the, the more people, I think the more people who learn this approach, the better our society will be and the more responsible we'll be with the claims we make. And, and that's exactly what I think we need at this moment. I totally agree with you. Yeah. If somebody were to approach you on the street, Anthony, and try SE on you. I'd love it. What belief would you I, choose? I'm so looking forward for that. To, if the, I, I can't wait. For, I know that's going to happen one of these days. And I don't know what, maybe what would I choose? I mean, I might choose my lack of belief in God my belief that there are no gods and get into okay. my reasoning why why i think that but you can do i could do a social position like you know my stance on gay marriage or what i think about burning the flag or whether the election was stolen or not or who i probably what i would do is who i plan on voting on the next presidential election <laughs> and my reasoning behind that i think that's probably what i would pick oh man i wish we had another hour yeah that would be interesting <laughs> i would do it I think the beauty of it is like, like you were saying, like, you don't have to be sneaky with it. Like in your videos, you just come right out with, Hey, Hey, I want to ask you about this. And 
I don't have any agenda. I don't have anything. I'm, I'm not trying to change your mind about anything. I'm just, I just want to hear your story. And mm-hmm. that immediately disarms people and allows them to say some things that maybe they wouldn't say if you were in like convincing mode. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it's a tricky, this is another tricky area is how much do you actually reveal? <laughs> because my goal might actually be to change their mind. Right. And if I don't reveal it, I don't know how I could say that I have their informed consent. And this is something that we're trying to bake into, in, not only to the course that we're developing, but just in, in the general practice of SE is at the very least, assure your conversation partner that they can ask you any question about what you're doing at any time. Yeah. Because what you might explain what you're doing could change in the middle of your conversation. You might want to take a pause and say, how is this going? Do you want to ask me questions about what I'm doing? Ideally, you don't want to be sneaky about what you're doing, even if your goal is to change their mind. The risk, though, is that saying, yeah, dad, like, I don't think that you're right. And it's my goal to help you realize that you have poor reasons. Like, (laughs) that's probably optimal. But as you were laughing right there, like, it's going to probably result in defensiveness. Yeah. And your dad might just say- what we want to avoid. (laughs) Right. And then you're arguing about why you would want to even do something like that. But that in itself gives you an opportunity to talk about truth. Like, well, dad, I really value truth. And I want to have- I want to have the claims that I make be supported by really good reasons. Is that something that you value? And, you know, you can have this, again, a broader discussion about truth and value. Or you could frame it as like, I would consider being a Christian or believing in religion if there are really good reasons. And I'm curious what your reasons are. And if they're really good, would you share them with me? Is That's that kind good. of, is that good? That, yeah. that, that is good. However, it, it, it frames the conversation for them to give you reasons that they think you'll find convincing. Oh. That, that's good to show that you're open, but you have to warn them and say, listen, yes, I'm open to changing my mind and you might have really good reasons for it. However, please don't give me reasons that you think I'm going to find convincing. Because how many times have we met a theist who does that, right? They give right. us a book. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they haven't even read the book. They just right. think that, well, this is the book you give doubting believers. <laughs> and you say, listen, I want to understand how you became convinced. Let's get, I want to explore your reasoning. And I might find that your reasoning is really good and maybe I want to adopt it. But um, yeah, try to try to take the pressure off of them to convince you. Okay. And ask them how they became convinced. I like the way you worded that. Yeah. yeah. It's a good start though. So kind of, this is kind of a more of a philosophical kind of question about what, why do you think people like hold on to their beliefs, even in the face of lack of evidence or bad evidence, or what's the motivation that causes people to hold on to a belief when it's unjustified or unverified or unproven? I think there's two main things. Uh, the first one is it meets psychos it meets psychological needs. Like a lot of people think that they need to think that they're going to see their loved ones again in order to get through through life. And then there's social needs. Me thinking that this is true puts me in good graces with my tribe. I remember like early on when I was going through my, my angry atheist phase or my resentful phase, I remember my godmother, my aunt asked me if I believed in souls. And I never thought about that before through the lens of an atheist. And I remember like going around to different atheist sites to see what they thought about souls. <laughs> I was actually looking to my tribe for the answer rather than coming up with the answer myself. Right. And I think we do that all the time. We're just not really aware that we're doing it. Right. So that's that. those are the main reasons. It, it meets psychological needs and it helps people get through difficulty. And then it ingratiates them with the tribe that they've come to trust and that has their back. I mean, so much of like our belief system, our belief system is based on, you know, where we were born, who our parents are, the culture around us. So yeah, that makes a lot of sense that you yeah. don't really put a lot of thought into your belief system, even though you might feel like you did put a lot of thought into it. Like I always thought I was a critical thinking believer. You know, I was very much into like exegetical study of the Bible and all this kind of stuff, but I was only looking through the lens that I had. There was all this information out here that I never even knew about or considered. Yes, and the widening of the lens is kind of what SE does. It's just, you know, it widens yeah, it that lens. Out. Yeah. So would you say it's kind of yeah. like comfort over truth for a lot of people? For a lot of people. Like they value comfort over truth. Yeah, I think a lot of people do. But for certain beliefs, that's the that's the weird thing about it is like when we navigate the world typically, we really value truth. We put on our seatbelts because we're convinced that it's dangerous to drive without our seatbelts on. 
we put clothes on, like we're, we're navigating reality as if truth is objective and truth matters. But for some subjects like gods or, or political things, we make exceptions. Mm -hmm. We set aside our valuation of truth for certain beliefs. But what I've discovered is a lot of people don't realize that they're doing it for those beliefs. They think they're being consistent and they're not, but telling them that they're not consistent isn't going to help them. Right. Engaging with them in conversation where you're asking questions and that suddenly becomes revealed by them. Mm -hmm. That's the trigger to get, to get people to reflect and change their minds. Mm -hmm. It's deep, man. I love it. Yeah. The, the truth thing I've always found really interesting because the whole thing that a lot of religious people, especially evangelical fundamentalists, truth is, is what they think is driving their, their whole thing. You know, the Bible is true. And I base everything on the Bible because the Bible's true and their definition of truth just doesn't make a lot of sense. Like, like you said, we view truth as something that might be objective and they think it's objective too, but it's really not. And then ask them the questions to try to demonstrate that their view of truth isn't objective it's very challenging. That's right. Yeah. I think, I think a lot of, the, this is where theists and skeptics or atheists, I think a line is that we all seem to think that there is an objective truth to the matter. But what tends to happen is when you are talking to a theist, what ends up getting revealed is that for certain claims, like the God claim, they are thinking about truth subjectively. They'll say something like, well, I'll take it. I take it on faith that the, my holy book has the truth. And then they'll give a definition of faith. And what that, what you find is that de that definition of faith can be applied to concluding that any God is real. Mm -hmm. You often hear us ask like the outsider test, something like, well, if a Hindu came by and said that they are convinced that their holy book is true because they take it on faith, what would you say about that? That's when they begin to realize that they're viewing truth subjectively and not objectively. And it's that disconnect that usually begins to it dawns on them that maybe they need better reasons than the ones that they're giving. And then that has implications for their confidence in their, in their current position. Yeah. I know you've done some follow-up videos and stuff, but have you ever like maintained a longer relationship with someone that you met through SE and then continued a relationship with them? And then maybe you, you talk to them a year later or two years later, five years later, and they changed. And have you ever heard about the process that they went through as a result of SC and like mm -hmm. what it was like for them. Like, There's the guy who has the skeptic show on the, <laughs> you know who I'm talking about. I can't remember his name. Yeah. Truth uh, Wanted. Truth right. Wanted. Objectively Dan on Truth yes, Wanted is, is one of a handful of people that come to mind. There's not as many people as I, as I wish, you know, I, I wish I would have kept in touch with more, but these are usually just like one-off stranger conversations. Although later on, I started offering people the gears so that they would come back for more talks. These guys, the puzzle pieces, those yeah, little yeah. puzzle piece things. So that I have one talk, I give them one piece, and then they'd come back for the other one. They come back because I wanted to see that that exact thing, like what's happening after six months or a year, but uh, not enough to be statistically significant. No, it, it's interesting. Like one person I kept I kept in touch with was Dan. Yeah, he he ended up transitioning out of Christianity into atheism, and now he's an atheist activist and. He's doing all sorts of amazing things. And then there's another person I talked to. He was a Christian. He identified as a male. And today she identifies as a trans female. Oh, wow. Like she, she's not only, she not only left religion, but she just completely changed her whole identity and transitioned. Is she on YouTube, on your YouTube channel? Or Yes. Yeah. Um, I remember that one. The, uh, their name is Zinnia now. So X-E-N-I-A are the videos. Okay. That's actually, I, I actually went back and changed all the names uh, oh, to, her, yeah. to her new yeah. name. That's nice. That's cool. So some, some people have profound shifts in, in their beliefs and their identities. There's another one that comes to my mind, but I can't remember his name. I think he had like reddish hair and you maybe first met him at the Alamo and he was a street mm -hmm. preacher. Mm -hmm. And then you met him a few years later, like on a bridge. And he had mellowed out significantly. I forgot about him. Yeah, that's Caleb. And I still get messages uh, from YouTube. People say like, I can't believe this guy. He's so irrational. And he's like the worst example of Christianity. And he was just like, blah, blah. You know, He just, was unhinged. He, he was in preach mode and he wouldn't yeah. listen. He wouldn't reflect. And then, yes, about three years later, I ended up meeting him again. Did he email? I think I emailed him. We ended up meeting and he was much more chill. He mm -hmm. was still a believer but he was a little bit more rational in his thinking. Yeah. And I, I can't, I mean, I would love to meet with him again in three more years and see where oh, he's please at. Please do. I, I yeah. think about him a lot. <laughs> yeah. Caleb is his name. If you want to watch those videos. 
Yeah. And he said his sister was an unbeliever. She just rejected it. I remember him saying that. Mm. But yeah, I just you got to wonder what happened in those three years to make him go from he I think he even said to you in the second video, like, you never know what somebody else has been through or what, you know, you can't walk in their shoes. And I just thought, wow, <laughs> it was a complete change from what what we had seen before yeah and speaking of script like when i first met him he was doing a a ray comfort script of have you ever lied and what does it mean to lie and are you you're a sinner and and god is the solution like he was doing his script and and i was trying to like get him to set aside a script and have a conversation he wouldn't do it the first time it could and i was also new to se back that this was 2015 i think and then we met again like in 2018 and yeah completely different person it's neat to see the growth that people, and also it's probably worth mentioning the growth is not only in the person who's on the receiving end of your questions, it changes you. Mm -hmm. So like, I know Phil, you mentioned like you like to argue and give people facts. I, I never do that these days. Like, and I'm much more careful about what I, what I claim to be the case. I'm much more careful about what I post on social media. I'm much more empathetic. I think towards people that I disagree with, even Trump supporters uh, or theists, for example, like, I can see them as separate from the beliefs that they hold. Even if they have the most odious views, I still think like I, I could reach that person if if I just had the time and if they were just open enough, they're just a victim of their circumstances. Exactly. And and not really carefully thinking about things. Yeah. So it like this this approach really tends to change you in a profound way. Yeah, you start to be able to separate the belief from the person. It kind of makes me think of, you know, the mantra that Christians use of love the love the sinner, hate the sin, mm. <laughs> you know, and they think that they're separating the person from the sin, which they're not, but it's the goal <laughs> of being empathetic of like looking at a person and realizing that what they believe isn't necessarily who they are, even though they believe that what they believe is who they are. You know, you've been a lifelong Christian. It's hard to fathom what your life would even look like without that identity. So, yeah. You also see like the benefit that the belief is giving them. That's the other thing is like, I can understand why they believe that because of all the value that that beliefs gives them. And I don't know if I could match the value that they're getting <laughs> currently <laughs> with my views. Right. You know, let's face it. It's, it's kind of tough to maybe think that you're not going to live forever after you die and see your loved ones. Right. It humbles you a little bit and maybe you become a little bit more compassionate. And sometimes you back off when you're engaged in SE with somebody and it seems like their life might fall apart or be significantly harmed if they were mm -hmm. to let go of that belief right you back off at that point this this is a personal decision based on whoever's doing the se but i think that's a big important consideration is you know in addition to asking yourself what are your goals like at that point you should probably be saying like at what point would i want to end this conversation or at what point is this now becoming harmful to them or at what point do i need to then provide them with resources or my time to help them find another community um, there's a certain responsibility, I think, when you use an approach like this, because it does seem to work and it does seem to help people reflect on their deeply held beliefs. And it, that whole process can be pretty painful. I don't know how it was for you guys when you, when, I assume you guys deconverted, you, you were believers at some point, and then you find your way out. Like It's not easy for a lot of people. You know, it could be really hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think especially older people, they've been, you know, set in their ways. And when I think about my parents possibly losing that belief, I, I'm not sure how they would cope. Yeah. I mostly just want them to understand my perspective and I, I just want them to know I'm not a lost sheep. I don't need saving. And I'm not sure how to get that across to them without changing their belief. Mm. Do you know what I mean? I do. Yeah. 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 We have, we have similar parents, but had different upbringings, which is interesting because like her parents are, I would say more educated and like gave you a little bit more free reign with like your, yeah. your upbringing. Mine was very rigid, but my parents are still very rigid believers and, and everything that now goes along with what Christian means. That's them. Christian nationalism, you know, the whole, the whole thing. I, I didn't even want to tell them about deconversion or anything. They actually kind of found out by accident. And then I had to kind of set the record straight, but like, I haven't really had any further conversations with them because my therapist asked me, he's like, well, what good do you think is going to come of it? And, and I didn't have a good answer for that, really. Mm -hmm. And I think SE would probably give me the ability of like, well, what good would come out of it is like, I could really understand where they're coming from and, and what they're getting out of it. I would be curious to see if they would even be willing to explore it. Yeah. And they're the only ones that can answer that question too. You know, you can ask them like, 
would you be interested in knowing my position on this, even though it might hurt you? Yeah. And then you might be surprised. They might say, well, yes, we love you enough and we'd love you regardless of what you think. And we'll talk with you. And then you might get the opposite. Like, no, <laughs> they may cut you loose or they just may de- be devastated for the rest of their life. If they realize you didn't believe or, you know, they could really struggle yeah. with the fear of thinking that you're going to burn, you know, in hell and all that stuff. Yeah. yeah. I think that's the thing. The burning yeah. in hell. The burning yeah. in hell is definitely a real problem for them for sure. But <laughs> yeah, um, I did a, I don't know if it, you care or not, but I, I did a role play on a, a, a podcast called Mormon stories. Oh, I where, listened to that. Did you, where the host, one episode, basically, only one. <laughs> okay. Well, the, the host, and both hosts role played as parents, and I was the atheist kid coming out to them. I don't know if your listeners might be interested in that, but I was basically explaining why I didn't believe, while at the same time slipping in a couple of questions to challenge them why they did. Nice. And it was a really kind of fine line. <laughs> I don't know how I did. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to listen to that. Yeah, it might be interesting for some people who are maybe thinking about having a conversation with their parents about that. Yeah, yeah. that sounds helpful. So you have, you've have you mentioned this a couple of times, which I found interesting, that like you see other areas of where SE can be useful. What are, what are some of those areas where you feel like, because it's one of those things like for us in, in a, like a post-religion podcast, you get, you can get like narrow focused on everything is about religion. And sometimes I feel like everything I look at, I'm looking for like the dumb religious belief in it, <laughs> you know, and like with SE, how do you view it as being expansive and other areas that it could apply to? I mean, I, I can't imagine a situation where you couldn't use it these days. I, I'm a little bit more aware of the things that our brains fall for. Mm -hmm. And now I try to operate in a way that tries to account for those things. Like another example is we had a generator just installed in our backyard and they were making some some determination about where to put it. And they settled on a location. And instead of just saying, oh, okay, I explored why they picked that location. You know, what was your reasoning? Why did you, why did you pick that? Why didn't, you know, why wouldn't over there be better because of those reasons? And what tends to happen is that you realize that maybe they didn't think about it. And we ended up picking a completely different location at the end of the result of that, just a little five minute exchange. <laughs> so, so there's, there's just so many benefits, I think, to understanding how people reason to their conclusions and the, the pitfalls that are, that you'll encounter along the way. So you can use it in your, in your daily life. Um, you can use it with your kids. Maybe they're deciding what school they want to go to, or they want to get a dog. <laughs> uh, or or they think that there's a monster under the bed. I mean, there there are regular everyday applications for using gentle questioning to explore reasoning far beyond yeah. why someone thinks God is real. Right. And that's why we're so excited about putting this course together is to teach people how to do this stuff. So I actually used SE with my son. I, I'm having a flashback now. It was a few months ago and he was telling me there was a monster in the basement and he was eight, I guess. And I was like, oh, well, what does the monster look like? And he said it was like big and hairy and that it was sleeping on the couch. And I went over to the couch and I said, well, I don't see any hair on the couch. Like, don't you think it would have, I guess this wasn't SE, but I was like getting him to explain no, his good. belief to me. And like, yeah. yeah. And in the end he realized like, well, yeah, I know it doesn't make sense, but that's my belief. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I, I wonder if you, if you had like, well, how sure are you that monsters are real before? And he did like a post question, like how sure are you now? I would imagine there probably would have been some shifting on it. Yeah. yeah. And even if there isn't immediately, like, that's the whole goal of SE is to help people reflect on their reasoning and the quality of the reasoning yeah. so that they can determine if they're, if they're comfortable with their reasoning. That's what usually ends up shifting people to more reasonable positions. So yeah, that's, that's, that's a great, that's a great example of using questioning to explore reasoning. Yeah. You're, you're trying to unpack the why behind things as opposed to attacking the what I think in our society, we're very much about the what yeah. and no one cares about the why. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. And we're usually giving reasons that we think that they'll be convinced by. And like we talked about earlier, you might get lucky. Like that might be the thing that they needed to hear, but what's, what's way more valuable. And it takes more time. It takes more discipline to do it the the long way. And that is to just hear them out, listen to what they're saying, figure out their reasoning, and then ask them some questions that challenge their reasoning in a, in a collaborative way. Yeah. And then figure out what their answers are and then ask more questions about that. That's really all it is. But I think it's also tempting to simplify it because 
there's lots of little wrinkles that people will throw into it that could make it a little more challenging, but that's, that's primarily what you're doing. Yeah. So you had mentioned earlier about faith. It's a pet peeve of Susie and I's the idea of faith. Mm -hmm, Me too. Do you consider that there's a, a valid use for faith? Like what's your views about faith in general? My view about faith is that the definition of it is untestable trust. Mm, I've never heard that. That's good. That's my personal definition that I think that's exactly essentially what people are, are, are meaning when they say faith Mm -hmm. is that believing something, even though you don't have the ability to test, to see if you're justified in thinking it. Right. That's my definition of faith. There might be some utility to faith. Like, I guess I have to have faith that the universe just didn't start five minutes ago. (laughs) That, that, that I've really been alive for as long as I've been alive and, and that type of thing. Like I can't test that. So I have to trust that that's the case, but I try to minimize the number of times I have to take something on faith or untestable trust as much as possible. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of people think that untestable trust or faith is virtuous. Yeah. That you're, you're, you're a good person if you believe something with no evidence. Right. And that yes. mentality I do, I really vehemently disagree with. I think all of our beliefs should be tested. You know, all of our trusts should be tested, whether my spouse is faithful or the chair will hold me or that, you, know, you name it. And that's what I struggled with my whole life because I never had faith. And I always thought it was because of me as a person. Like I thought there was something lacking inside me or something wrong with me or something like I wasn't as good, quote unquote, good as the rest of my family or my friends at church, because everybody just seemed to accept this with zero questions and zero doubts. And I was full of nothing but doubt. <laughs> and that really kind of messed with my head. Like I felt there was something wrong with me. But now I know there's not. <laughs> and I don't want any part of faith. Yeah, that's been a recent discovery of mine, too, is like where I used to think faith was such a virtue. But now I it's just delusion. Like it's and I always thought that that was so harsh when I heard, I think Christopher Hitchens or something say, you know, it's mm. faith is a delusion. And I was like, oh, that's so mean. Like, why would you say that? But, but now I'm like, <laughs> oh shit, he was right. Like it really is. It's just like, you're basing it on nothing. You're just basing it on how you feel about something. And yeah, that, that's okay. Maybe for some things, but not for like major things in your life. Exactly. Like, so it, think about it. If your God belief is one of the this is mostly for your listeners, by the way. <laughs> but if, you're, if your God belief is one of the most important things in your life, why would you want to base it on something that you can't test to be the case? Right. Why would you base it on faith, which is, I, I've, I define it as untestable trust, but people might define it differently. Go with their definition, not yours. But if they mm-hmm. ask you yours, you feel free to give your definition. Like, yeah, it's such a big, important decision. Why wouldn't you want to, to be able to confirm to yourself that it's actually correct? Right. In this lifetime, right? yeah, yeah, right. Don't just don't just offload it and say, "Well, we'll figure out when we die." Well, no, you won't. Not <laughs> not if it's not true. Yeah, and there's no proof that you will know when you die. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Should we talk about the scientific studies real quick? Oh yeah, yeah. We that's... love science on the show, so yeah. Me too. What's going on there? What's new on the science aspect? Well, people who are into SE are usually skeptical, and we need more than just anecdotal evidence or videos of people who have changed their mind. We want to see if there's actually something to this approach, if there's something to the technique rebuttal approach that we've been talking about. So uh, me and a few colleagues, we, f- we formed Street Epistemology International, which is a nonprofit. And one of our main goals is to find people willing to objectively study street epistemology in a rigorous way to see if it does the things that we claim that it does. Does it inspire reflection? Does it improve clarity on people's beliefs? Do people feel less attacked and more willing to talk about that conversation later? Uh, Do people change their minds or lower their confidence or increase their confidence? Like, what is the impact of this approach? We've been putting out feelers. And finally, somebody said, I want to study what you're doing. And just a few hours ago, we had our third or fourth meeting now with this individual. And we're sketching out what our methodology would be for how do we represent an SE dialogue in an objective way that can be repeated hundreds or thousands of times mm-hmm. to be able to derive some data from it. Right. And that's where we're at now. So yeah, I'm pleased to say that that we're really making some progress on that front. And what I think is going to happen is once we get this first study done, which I think in a lot of people's eyes, it'd be like, that's all you studied, like big book. <laughs> but I think it's going to lead to more studies. It's going to, it's going to start the ball rolling on people yeah. really taking a look at what we're doing. Because I mean, it's clear to me as a practitioner or promoter, of this approach 
like I've seen firsthand how this changes the people that I'm speaking with and me. And I've had countless other people report the same things. You know, we want some data to back up what we're doing so we can get some research and really start developing tools to, to maybe like, maybe there's even a way to take the elements of an SE interaction that generates the type of reflection that could lead to belief revision. Maybe there's even a better way of doing it than just a one-on-one conversation. Maybe, maybe it could be a pamphlet or a billboard or, or a class exercise that you do with a group of 30 people the next time you're, you're at school or something. We want to try to figure out what that is so that we can give people these tools and make it a part of our everyday inter- interactions. So, so that's, that's, that's where we're at with the research part of it. That's fascinating. Yeah, that's cool. And it's mm-hmm. probably hard to try to like quantify because like right now, what it feels like is so nebulous and whatever. And it's like, well, now I have to make it quantifiable. So that's yeah. be an interesting challenge. Yeah. And it, it, I think we're, we're going to always be dependent on the self-reporting of the participants. So there's a little bit of like a, a liability with the data there. Like they could be lying or they could just be saying something just to make so that, you know, you have good results or something, but, but hopefully we get a big enough uh, data set and we can, we can start capturing some of those things. Um, but it's, it's a start, you know, we think it, it'll be, it'll be the first of many that will come. And we may, we may find that this approach doesn't work. That would like, be sad. I, it would <laughs> yeah. be sad. It would be sad. I would be a little sad because in my mind, it seems to work. I'd be really shocked if, if there wasn't something to it, but at the very least we could say, okay, well, we need to tweak what we're doing, or maybe we should look at a different approach like deep canvassing where they do embed emotional narratives to convince or something. I, I, I don't know. But you would go where the data leads, right? I, I want to go where the data leads, even if it shows that what we're doing is harmful or in, ineffective. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But I think having a quantifiable data study that gives you a level of credibility that is would be like amazing. <laughs> like that would be really I cool. I think so because then then we can start the grant writing process and getting funding to do what we're doing and maybe teaching governments or institutions mm-hmm. in academia or the military or businesses how to do this stuff. Yeah. So yeah. it would be nice to have some scientific backing behind what we're doing to really start pushing the tools forward. Right, right. Is this your uh, full-time job doing this or do you have a day job? I don't have a day job. I'm, I'm a stay-at-home dad. Uh, my wife is a doctor. She's got a great job. So for the last almost 10 years now, um, I've been basically like an activist and I don't know, am I, am I an activist? I guess I'm an <laughs> activist, but like I see myself more as a promoter of this approach and developing yeah. it. Yeah. And I, I don't get paid doing what I'm doing, but it's a passion of mine. Yeah. A lot of atheists and humanists and secularists will say, well, we don't evangelize. We're not trying to convince anyone that atheism is the right way or whatever. And you're not doing that either, but you're definitely doing an outreach that is encouraging people to think, which I think is even, it's more important than convincing people to believe the way you believe, encouraging more people to critically think. Yeah. There's no downside to that, you know, like, right. except for systems of power that have been using people exactly you know yes and and the the sheepfold (laughs) revolting you know that's critical thinking is going to tear down some some strongholds for lack of a better term (laughs) just goes charismatic on you i like to say that that we're evangelizing for critical thinking and, and more more responsible thinking and the claim itself that's being explored this is what's sort of problematic with SE is that because it started in atheism to explore God beliefs, we've sort of been pigeonholed as that. Yeah. One of the reasons why I've been trying to get away from these type, you know, and I'm I'm loving this, by the way, don't get me wrong. <laughs> but like, we're really trying to, to position SE as a tool that can be used for all different types of claims to improve the quality with which we reason. Right. That's what this tool is about. Yeah. Now that has implications for certain beliefs. And certain institutions, especially if you're dependent on faith, for example, like you should probably be a little concerned about what we're doing because I think it has implications for what we're doing. Right. But that's not our fault. That's, that's your challenge. What's the big things that you're working on now? You got the study, you mentioned like putting together a course. What's kind of your goal there with the course? The goal with the course right now is to get subject matter experts in street epistemology from around the world who have volunteered to help us extract all of our knowledge and make it in a really simple, digestible 
format. And we're, we're like, we're going for the whole thing. We've been working at it for like almost for about two years now. So for the last two years, and we're only a third of the way, we're not even a third of the way through, we're like a quarter of the way through. And in the process of boiling down what it is we're doing, we're also learning what it is we're doing. Mm-hmm. So I've learned more about SE in the last two years than I probably have in the last five prior. Hmm. So we're trying to take this expertise, simplify it and distribute it to people so that they can learn how to start incorporating this into their, their daily interactions. Even if it's just one question, getting people to be more f- comfortable asking epistemological types of questions to improve the sanity waterline across the entire world. That's really our goal with the course. And then I think what's going to happen is when we develop this huge self-directed course, we're going to start um, creating little offshoot courses, maybe something for kids, like a 90 minute exercise when you go to camp and you can have somebody teach you something along the lines where maybe we teach you how to be a little bit more responsible with, with your reasoning. We're going to start seeing little offshoot components or maybe even products. <clears throat> we're kind of reaching this point where we're starting to incur a lot of expenses with what we're doing. And we're going to probably, the, the, the self-directed course will probably be free, but maybe we'll start charging for facilitator-led courses. And mm-hmm. and maybe uh, here's here's five little exercises that you can you can teach to your camp or a group full of, of students. You know, well, that's probably where, where we're heading with that. Yeah. Because the research stuff takes, it's expensive and, you know, we're, we're spending a lot of money. So we need to cover those expenses. So what's the uh, best way for us and, and our listeners to support you in your endeavors? If you don't want to donate any money, just simply watch a few SE videos, share your observations and give people feedback. Give them a little bit of gentle encouragement, maybe with some constructive criticism. That's like a really easy thing that you could do. Uh, so just support the people that are creating examples to show people how to do this would be good. And then if you want to make a monetary donation, you can go to streetepistemology.com and there's a button that says donate at the top. And, you know, 50 bucks would just be awesome. You know, we we could use that to cover some of the expenses that we're incurring, hiring people. Yeah. We have illustrators and even this, even this research project will probably cost us a little bit to, to yeah. incentivize people to, to go through and do it. Right. Yeah. Right. Cool. So, so you mentioned street epistemology.com. What's, what's other places people can find you. We're going to post like your whole your link tree. link tree thing in the, in oh, the notes, cool. but give a plug for a, f- a few of them. So people can know where to find you. Yeah. My Twitter bio. So my, my last name, Magna Bosco is my Twitter handle. So you can find me on Twitter. And then in my bio, there's a link tree link, which it sounds like you're going to include. So you can find my my channel, my LinkedIn, my Instagram. I have a TikTok channel. And I, <laughs> lately, I've been so busy. I haven't been creating a lot of content other than this the strategic level stuff that we've been doing. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's pulled me a little bit away from, from putting out examples. Oh, there's yeah. also a really, if you want to see video examples of people doing this from around the world, on the Street Epistemology website under resources, there's a link to a playlist that we keep active with all sorts of video examples. So like if you really, if you released a video example, this interview, we would stick it in that playlist, for example, and there's all sorts of SE related stuff in that playlist. Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Well, our friend Caitlin, who dared us to contact you, (laughs) she has an Etsy shop where she makes t-shirts. It's an atheist shop, but there's other things like Phil, show your shirt. Oh, action over prayer. That's from her shop. (laughs) (laughs) Well, she wants to give you a free t-shirt. So we'll connect you with her. Yeah. Cool. Free shirt for Anthony. We'll connect you with her um, after this and you can pick out whatever you want from her shop. Uh, That's very nice. Thanks, Caitlin. Appreciate it. (laughs) Yes. And she, she's the one that kind of put this all together with her uh, motivational speaking. So (laughs) nice. Well, now I'm really glad I didn't say no to your your offers (laughs) to interview me. (laughs) Free threads, free threads. (laughs) So cool. Well, thanks, Anthony, for uh, just giving us so much time. I mean, Susie and I were both like, holy crap, you said yes. Like, now what? And and then you and then we were expecting you to be (laughs) like, yeah, (laughs) we were were like, oh, well, maybe it'll be like in a month. And you're like, well, how about next Tuesday? And we're like, oh, crap. (laughs) So. So, yeah, that's awesome. I'm glad it worked out. And I mean, this is a really a fun conversation. So much. this made my month. No, it made my year. Oh, awesome. Wow. That's great. And thank you for spreading the word about SE to to your audience. And there's a, I should mention also there's on the disc, there's a link to a discord server where we have regular practice volunteers regularly hold practice sessions. Yeah, okay. So if you're, if you're planning to do a talk with somebody, you can go there and practice, or you can just listen in and give feedback. It's really cool. Oh, cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's who you have in your ear when you're doing your talks, right? You always have them. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Are you going to go out and do any more? I don't think you've uploaded videos in a while, right? I haven't. I'm not the COVID's over. There's, um, I might go out and do it again, but I might do a sit down version where I'm under a canopy 
because it's so hot. <laughs> yeah. Some fans. Yeah. yeah, I'm becoming a little bit more high maintenance as I get older. Yeah. So I, I might start recording some more with with another person. I, I might even start a meetup group in San Antonio where I can get a group of people and we go out and do it That'd somewhere. Cool. Oh, I wish we were closer. Yeah. I'm totally where, do, where are y'all at? I'm in Maryland. He's in I'm Virginia. I'm in Virginia, yeah. Oh, okay. Appreciate it. Thanks again, uh, Anthony. We'll let you get to whatever you got to get to, but thanks again for, for speaking with us. We appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I really enjoyed it. All right. Hey, everybody. Well, thanks for uh, listening to this episode. We did mention earlier in the episode uh, about Caitlin and her shop called Atheist Aesthetic. Let me say it right. So that way people can go to it. It's Atheist. Okay. Maybe I can't say it. (laughs) See, you can't say it either. Okay. Okay. Awesome. All right. I got nervous. It's an Etsy shop. It's called Atheist Aesthetic. It's a tongue twister, which is part of the fun. But when you type it in, it's much easier. But she has a really cool shop on there that has uh, a lot of real creative designs around uh, atheism and humanism and, and free thought. So, And Caitlin was so excited about connecting with us, she decided to grant our listeners with a discount code, which is FLAWED, F-L-A-W-E-D. So you get a 15% off discount if you go to her shop and use that code. And we're not cool enough to actually have sponsors or we're going to start doing commercials, but really we just wanted to help her shop out because she was cool enough to connect with us and and we wanted to help support her. So definitely go check out her shop and we'll probably be posting some links and pictures to some of her stuff as well. So check out Atheist Aesthetic. Follow us at the flawed theology podcast.com and subscribe to us wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Please rate and review us on Google, Spotify, Apple podcasts. We're on all kinds of platforms. Now I can't even keep track of them all. Give us five stars. Yeah. All the stars, all of them. Well, thanks for listening everybody. And we will talk to you next time. We'll probably be posting some links and pictures to some of her stuff as well. So yeah, check out Atheist Aesthetic. Okay. I didn't have to say yeah. I'm going to edit that out. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I contributed yeah. absolutely nothing to that conversation. <laughs>